Nature is a bitch. Um, <laughs> it's the title, obviously. Uh, what I mean with that is um, how complex and often contradictory the role of nature in our built environment is and how difficult it is to actually achieve a sense of nature. L nature, la nature, uh, of course, is female, uh, but she's not just any female, and for sure she is not Mother Nature. She's a bitch. Uh, I, I would say she's a high-maintenance uh, bitch. Uh, a lover, perhaps. Um, my very good friend, uh, Harm Horling, she's a landscape architect in Holland, Talking about Holland, things are not good with landscape and with nature right now, uh, considering uh, current uh, political changes. So one could also say, and I quote her directly, uh, nature is a leftish <coughs> hobby. This is on governmental policy level. Uh, so nature is a bitch. Um, and with this lecture, I wanted to touch, touch upon some of the paradoxes associated with nature and show some of our work uh, through this lens. Even though uh, the work might not have been constructed with nature in mind in the first place, but I'm trying to kind of uh, illustrate or illuminate how one could look at projects through some kind of nature. And then I will end this, this lecture with a kind of slightly longer talk about a project we did in New York, and that is just uh, completed uh, last year. A tiny project but, uh, with a big, uh, enormous endeavor. Okay. Okay. Has anybody seen this creature? It lives on Fairmount uh, in the Mile End. Uh, close to a uh, park. Um, while at the same time, uh, new or hybrid species are developing as they are completely adapted and at ease in a changing environment, a continuous effort is being made to eradicate nature, to exterminate nature. Um, this pigeon, let's go is of course completely adapted to the city of Cirque du Soleil. Uh, and maybe uh, you know some of this in Montreal. Uh, they do, they like rats and mice here, as you can see. And there's one, two, three, three of those in here. Uh, it's also about exterminating. Uh, the Jeffrey Mine in Asbestos, uh, two hours east of Montreal, um, and any asbestos mines in the Eastern Township, is the subject of the studio I'm currently teaching here, and there are some students here in the audience. It is fantastic. Put some pressure <laughs> on them. Uh, the mine uh, is at once awe-inspiring and devastatingly barren. Its contested environmental impact is global and local. Mining practices, with in particular the Jeffrey Mine, continues to trigger intense political debate. This is Le Devoir. La Presse. Uh, that was a library uh, publication. And this past Friday, there was an article actually even in the New York Times, uh, Bernard Coulomb, or Bernie, uh, as he apparently goes by, uh, did a big interview. Um, he uh, loves asbestos. Uh, the media, this media attention presents great momentum to explore future scenarios for a mining landscape of this kind within an academic setting. And what we're trying to do is to add a collection of propositions to the political debate at its most basic level, is developing ideas, big and small, as to how this barren landscape can be improved. 
And uh, our final review for which we are inviting you is uh, the 19th to the 21st, and the 21st, 19, 20, 21st of April. Here you can see it's um, a little small precedent is uh, this project, a finalist at the Metis Festival, uh, where we, um, where the, the subject was paradise. And so perhaps this was the inverse of paradise. And this is with Ikip. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, related in scale and somewhat subject matter is this project called MoJob. It's a very old one and it's still alive, strangely enough, uh, but perhaps not so long anymore. Uh, and this is uh, developed with all the people from Nip Paysage. Fantastic. Uh, we have roots uh, together that, that go back. Uh, uh, for a uh, landscape architect in the Netherlands, Noel van Doren, uh, who uh, has a research on landfills. And this project, this is a dike on the edge. It's a very historical landscape, uh, this landfill. It's a polluted soil, a contaminated soil depot. So what you can see on the right is it's like a big filing cabinet where soils of different kinds of pollution are stored in bags uh, until they know what to do with it in the future. And they put a big uh, pile of dirt on it, make a roly-poly landscape and call it a day. So for a festival called Sail, where thousands of ships coming from the North Sea going to the center of Amsterdam pass by a canal, the, this company, the director of the company, wanted to celebrate, uh, wanted to do something to bring this landfill, this polluted uh, site, into the public attention. And we did that through using this edge of this landfill, uh, which was right at the canal, a mile, mile uh, long, uh, with very simple ingredients, mowing and painting, um, to bring it in the center of attention. So, which you can see here. So, in a way, it's a, it's a, this mo job is a mile long drawing. Uh, and based on the width of a mowing machine, amount of paint that we had, and we wanted to use orange because, of course, orange is the national color, but that was considered too polluted, too much in reference to contamination and poison. We could not use orange. Orange, of course, is one of the best colors in the universe. Hence, the project is politically whitewashed. Um, 2000, this was done in 2000. It's also a time I was working for Martha Schwartz, so considerations of geometry, uh, visual representation, cultural landscapes were all kind of in the background of these endeavors. Um, um, and here, the landscape in the north is this historical flat landscape, a very uh, high water table. So in a way, this landscape celebrates the horizontality of the Dutch landscape, but also this kind of linear organization and geometrical organization of the constructed landscape beyond. What I wanted to say about uh, that it's still alive is that uh, though it was meant for one day, just the arrival of the ships in Amsterdam, and they continued this mowing regime, so like alternated mowing regime, so uh, wild and fluffy grass on one side, um, tightly cut mowed grass on the other. They continue actually to do that to this day, uh, which is 11, 12 years now. So that's really, you know, success of its project. Um, also, a trace of asbestos was found in these uh, bags. And finally, they will be... Um, making the mound higher, uh, which is a Dutch mountain. Uh, they need more uh, storage space for polluted uh, material. So, okay, this image is a collection of contemporary concerns, preoccupations, uh, following a collective pursuit of uh, sustainability in all levels of society. There is a fundamental shift in the role of design and the built world, one where being good and doing good is central to all its endeavors. 
This incredible wave of working towards a better world permeates all levels of society. Think Zizek and Starbucks, and is the, the powerful motor of achieving global change. In this collective endeavor, landscape is starting to play an important role, if not a pivotal role. Ideas of landscape have the potential to be the building block of our or, uh, environmental organization. At the core of all these collective concerns is how, we, how our environment can be improved, not necessarily aesthetically, but ecologically, operationally, and consumptively. Parks are like pizza. They're good, no matter how bad they are. Um, and yes, parks and green spaces in our environment are good for us, yet there are many conditions that cry out for life, for inhabitation and colonization, for complex life forms. Many conditions are barren, denuded and characterized by desertification. Think open pit mines, think the asphalt universe. Rather than the token tree in the parking lot, how can we bring nature, dynamic processes, into an otherwise singular or monochromatic condition? Or in other words, how can we bring wild nature back into our immediate vicinity? I use the word nature here in this most generic context as to have the power of inclusion rather than exclusion. It is also related to my affinity to populist landscapes. Where is hell? Hell. Hell is this is a quote for hell, from hell way back when. Or landscapes of uh, mass culture as they affect the largest number of people and are often dumbed down intellectually and creatively. So work to be done there. Of course, nature is a social construction, a cultural concept, and therefore has the innate ability to change and adapt with us. In 1995, Bill Cronin discussed profoundly the dilemmas and paradoxes associated with nature as a cultural construct and identified 10 popular conceptions of nature. Mother nature, uh, um, nature as, it, as the other, uh, what's, it, what's the word, consumer nature, nature to consume emphasizing complex and contradictory ideas of nature, so typical of modernity. So the book is called uh, Uncommon Ground. You can see it. Very good book. It's really worth reading. Um, going back in time to 1967, uh, Roderick Nash argues that the idea of wilderness resists easy definition as it is a personal, symbolic, and changing kind. The concept of wild is applicable to those parts of nature not subject to human control. Uncontrolled nature became wilderness, still associated with the unknown, the disordered, the dangerous. It must be killed. Clearly, wilderness must be outside of urbanity rather than inclusive. I would argue that civilization continues to eradicate, control, and excludes many forms of nature that have, that have established right beside us. Gilles Clément's Manifesto on the Tiers Paysage, or Third Landscape, addresses leftover or transitional spaces in the city and countryside. I gotta do this uh, dry piece, okay? So bear with me for a little bit. It's soon it's over. Um, um, proposing that these are key to restoring the complexity and biodiversity of our natural landscape. Clément is a horticultural, horticultural engineer, landscape architect, and gardener. He proposes a strategy based on returning certain spaces to nature rather than allowing them to be developed to ensure processes of ecological diversity. Les délaissés, leftover spaces, have a rich biological potential and are to become sanctuaries 
for the broadest diversity in the ecosystem, the carriers of our biological future. Well, Gilles Clément advocates leftover spaces in the city as seed and species repositories. Okay. Uh, scientist Peter Del Tredici considers spontaneous plants or wild urban plants or as wheat species or invasive species as the plants of the future. His premise is that the ecology of the city is not defined only by the cultivated plants that, requiring, that require ongoing maintenance and the native species that are restricted to protected natural areas, but also to the plants that dominate the neglected interstices of the urban environment. Recent research indicate that if left undisturbed long enough to develop into woodlands, it can provide cities with important social and ecological services at very little cost to taxpayers. Cheap, weed, weed species are cheap. His, what he calls brave new ecology, consists of a collection of native and foreign species that made themselves at home in harsh urban environments and can withstand stress factors such as drought problems caused by paving, osmotic drought through de-icing salts, drainage problem, soil compaction and air pollution. As far as I'm concerned, his wild urban plants are the superhero plants of the future. And then um, uh, Bridget Baines and Ilko Hoftman of a landscape of a company from the UK called Gross Max. They did a studio at Harvard uh, last year uh, called Nature Activation Rather Than Conservation. And to quote them, um, nature is considered the raw material, both a resource and a product of new bioengineered technologies, endless modifications and stimulating hybridizations between organic and inorganic matter. And with this quote, I just wanted to introduce uh, this project called Flying Orchids. And uh, they were indeed flying, as there is an elevator door at the end, and every time that the elevator door opened and a draft would come in, these orchids would start to move and really activate the space. Uh, this project was our response to an invitation by Harvard to show our work. So rather than show our work, we felt we would do a project. We uh, had proposed uh, in a site in Venezuela um, this project called Flying Orchids, a very dense uh, urban plot where the only nature we could introduce would be associated with walls. Um, so we felt that maybe we would do a mock-up of that project in this space, a very dead space. We used a video blue for the walls, there's lights, but effectively there's steel cables strung between concrete columns from which we hang uh, orchids. Uh, and orchids are epiphytes, as you might know. That means their water and nutrients come from the air. They do not need any soil. Um, in the contemporary city, soil is a precious commodity. Most vegetation is found in planters on structure without access to soil and groundwater. Orchids, on the other hand, are epiphytes and receive their nutrients and moisture not from the soil, but from the air. They are kind of liberated plant species. Therefore, conceptually, they are most adaptable to modern urban life. And this installation exhibits uh, this condition most blatantly uh, by hanging organs at their point of equilibrium. Um, we uh, just bought them in the grocery store. And uh, a label said, uh, uh, if they have no more flowers, you have to throw them away and buy a new one. So mass, mass production and mass consumption. Uh, but what was really interesting is that the show was up for at least a month and we had uh, two uh, spray bottles standing on the floor. So uh, a number of people in the school came out of the woodworks that were apparently uh, orchid aficionados 
and they started to become the kind of the caretakers of the of these orchids. So it was really working. And this is a lovely uh, little project. Um, Uh, Martha's Vineyard the Historical uh, Preservation Trust, where uh, we were asked to do a small project, but we kind of redid the whole island, I think. Uh, but the, the part that I wanted to share with you is that these are all the lawns in the town of Edgar Town, uh, manicured, uh, sanitized, hygienic, uh, for a population that uh, is here only maybe, what, four weeks out of the years, Martha's Vineyard, uh, for God's sake. So uh, the red buildings are the properties of the Historical Preservation Trust, um, and the site that we are proposing is the light yellow. So we just propose to change um, this lawn, and actually all the lawns on this property, into a wildflower meadow, which you see on the left. And then um, there's some other issues with uh, an arbor, a uh, big, big long arbor. It used to be the highest point on the island. Uh, this house, uh, this is the Wailing Church. This house from the top, the widows, or at least the women whose men were out to sea whaling would look out and look at the ocean to see if their beloved ones would come home or not. So we wanted to really, in a landscape way, emphasize this high point in the landscape. But that has nothing to do with the subject of nature right now, or less to do. And this project uh, was a utopian project, um, elitist also, I think, where a client, uh, a uh, very wealthy Chinese developer wanted to uh, build 5 million square foot of real estate uh, on this series of islands, archipelago, um, west of Shanghai. Uh, all the black is water. And um, four workers, ch Chinese people, Chinese, uh, uh, work a lot of hours and do not tend to see their family that often. Um, so, the idea was that they would work here, they come here for a week, two weeks, uh, with their family, with their wife and children, be with them and work at the same time in this incredible environment. Uh, the way how we interpreted the master plan of this project is through infrastructure and water, and therefore that all built development should happen at the edge of the water and that everyone at all times would have a an, an connection to the water, whether it's small water or big water. Some of them are islands, some of them are piers. So these diagrams uh, intend to show that. It was a very complex project. It was done on a competition level. There were three teams invited. And one by one, they fell off and they wanted to keep working with us, which was fantastic. And then uh, the project stopped. And you'll see an idea of uh, the intimacy of the project. And then this project um, is on the drawing table right now. Uh, it's here in the circle, Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, and its dilemma is uh, it's 60 by 80 feet, so it's tiny. And these are the things that the community wants to happen. They want a space for birds, uh, and they want a space for people. Uh, half of the community wants dogs in there, off-leash. The other half does absolutely not want dogs, which is the biggest political issue right now. Um, there's mature trees on the site, as you can see, but they're weed trees. So half of the people want to cut down the trees, the other half wants to keep them. 
And then what to plant next, native species or uh, ornamental species. Some people want kids, other people do not want kids. And then this also needs to happen all there. <laughs> so the process is slow. <laughs> Uh, I think that this is a really interesting uh, drawing uh, because Somerville is one of the densest towns in New England. Uh, what it really means is there's a relatively little open space or large open water bodies per capita. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure on these little pockets of land uh, that uh, the city wants to develop um, uh, as open space. This, the light green shows planted street trees. However, the dark green show uh, trees, wheat species, invasive trees that have nestled themselves on the edges of property. And because they were in the back, uh, they just stayed there and had a chance to really mature uh, and become really, really big and play a bigger role uh, in the city uh, for many reasons, spatially, oxygen, um, reducing carbon footprint, etc., and then the street trees do. So they are also on the side. These are the birds out there. And this is what birds need. Um, insects, little cre creepers that people don't want. Um, so we are uh, in a kind of diagrammatic stage, believe it or not where there is some kind of a path and a lot of vegetation. Okay, having said that, I wanted to go to the next project. Kind of the lecture called On Asphalt. It's a long-term endeavor. This is the problem, too much hardscape and too much impermeable surface. Uh, this is an asphalt figure ground, uh, the Denver Bronco uh, Stadium. On the left, football stadium have the largest amount of continuous uh, parking surface, but you also see highways and um, asphalt associated with um, an industrial park. Uh, this is a project we did in Metis where the asphalt project started uh, and it's an asphalt garden with the intent to bring something mundane uh, and ordinary as a garden into the pristine setting of the Metis forest. Uh, with a road vernacular, you know, the double line that becomes paths, uh, text, arrows. And the year after, we were asked to do something else on this plate, and we uh, suggested that uh, at that time, uh, Michelle Adrian, she's from Venezuela, uh, the whole city was on the road uh, demonstrating. The, the, the road became the arena for public demonstration. So we wanted to really celebrate the road as a space for uh, political debate by shoes um, from many people from everywhere. Uh, the army boots, black, suggest uh, opposition. There is a website uh, on asphalt, also with the intent to uh, inspire change in asphalt. And uh, the way we see it is that um, asphalt is the most public landscape. It's more public than a park. It's more public than a playground because we use it every day, yet at the same time, uh, we are, it's unengaged, it's not creatively used, uh, it's programmatically singular. Uh, so to break open that uh, dichotomy is what we're trying to do. Um, uh, this is a research uh, we did with a number of students developing uh, alternatives at these scales. Gillette Stadium, 10,000 spaces. Uh, <clears throat> and these images suggest the possibility of infiltrating, you know, opening up asphalt and having groundwater recharged with water through piping and perfora perforation. We we'll try to test that. Yeah. 
nature can be introduced in uh, symbolic or metaphor metaphorically. And here a tree branch was uh, rolled in the asphalt and filled in with latex. Um, and the reference project for that was a parking lot with big trees. So the shadow of these trees would travel over this parking lot. So what if this one moment, this, this shadow would be manifested as a, as a white drafted shadow? So to bring an attention to the ground plane. Could also be done through saw cutting, changing the texture. It's a diamond saw from Home Depot. So we tried to, to bring, literally bring vegetation into uh, uh, an asphalt surface. Uh, and what we did, uh, this project was done in um, April. And this image is um, uh, in August. So after, uh, after a whole summer of heat absorption, just imagine it's black, it absorbs heat, it's super hot. There's no water, you know, you would imagine it dies. The grass is not doing that well, but the weeds that we found in the surrounding areas were thriving. And we had some fun as well with the asphalt guys, you know, pogo stick. <laughs> and to think about asphalt, not so much in longevity, but just imagine that this would be a speed bump. Would not work with snow plows, though. And we uh, explored uh, program hybrids. So this project is across a theater where um, during the day it would be a parking lot and at nighttime it would be a stage. And this is called the car crash planter. Uh, and it's a spun on um, uh, the urban heat island effect, which was in the newspaper last weekend, that when there's no one parked, the thing would be covered uh, with vines. But when a car comes, you just move it over. It would be fantastic to build this one day. <laughs> and then uh, conversely, uh, football stadiums are very bad things, I think because there are seven games a year uh, and for 10 to 20,000 parking spaces uh, cut out of the forest, which is the case at Foxborough Stadium right here. Uh, Chris Lucius investigated uh, when those games are and is there a way to collect water uh, for um, planting uh, alternative energy sources. So this is the mock-up that we did, and this is the way it works. So the green would be um, hollows or these balls for the vegetation, and the other would be, and so the, the use of this site would change over time. I think it's a fantastic project. You know, it's tied in also to the groundwater circulation in the forest. Um, this is an event uh, with the on asphalt people to print this poster with steam rollers on a parking lot. Uh, these are magnesium plates with a graphic designer, uh, Rick Rollins, and an illustrator. This image that you see is done by a California artist. More research on topography, and then a research that is related to, uh, you know, do we really need so many paved roads and how many are there? So uh, in a way, um, public roads, so not <coughs> private roads, just public roads, you can drive around the earth 161 times. That's how many roads there are in the United States. The pink is dirt roads, which would only be 56 <coughs> times. And so the pink is dirt roads uh, by total, the percentage by total road length by state. And then we did a book uh, titled On Asphalt. And we hope to do an exhibition in, the, in Cambridge in the spring 
where we are making uh, pothole castings, uh, hopefully, uh, but also show a lot of work that's been done on, with, on asphalt. So and this is the project, I'll go a little bit more in detail, called Asphalt Tattoo. We did uh, last year in New York, um, <coughs> with Wanted and Chris Lucius, where we are interested in this kind of space. So actually what happened, uh, there was an article in the Boston Globe. Uh, um, someone at the New York Department of Transportation read that, invited me to come and talk to them. Uh, and wanted to do a project with us. So we are talking, new, uh, the New York Department of Transportation owns all the roads, all the highways. It's like the biggest entity in the city. Um, however, they had $5,000 uh, to do a project with us. Fees, travel, and material. <laughs> this is what I'm showing you right now. So we, we had to go through the formal process. And it's not that we are interested in art, but what's happening is when something is an art project or a temporary art project, we have leeway of experimentation because it ha does not have to be built for 10 years. It's perhaps just one summer. Uh, we do not have, it can be done for low, little, little money. Uh, and there is no kind of responsibility to a community or zoning boards or approval. So an idea can remain pure in its essence rather than being compromised on many different levels. So for us, that is really the purpose of art, to be able to do experimental landscape because it's so little possible elsewhere. So I, for me, therefore, this project is interesting. So we were interested in working with little sites like this that are kind of a no man's land. They don't belong to the road, they don't belong to the sidewalk, they belong to nobody. So we did two proposals. This proposal that we thought, mm, they're not gonna go for that, uh, <laughs> which would be fantastic, and it's this great uh, location, Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge is what it's called, with these big arches and real great uh, space on, uh, underneath it. This is also the bridge, but at a different spot. Um, and this was another of these kind of um, leftover uh, spaces. And that's especially interesting because New York City, the entire city has a big endeavor to really bring these little pockets back into the public domain rather than have them you know, and traffic island. Here also there's a little kind of a park to the side. So we proposed this kind of very dumb surface uh, treatment with uh, crushed colored glass inlay as a kind of ex uh, conceptual extension of the park. Uh, and then, uh, when we were shortlisted for this project, uh, we felt the leaves were dumb, they were corporate, it was just after the Tor Toronto Winter Games. So, let's not do the leaves, sorry guys, but let's do something else. So, we did a whole series of uh, kind of try, trying what imagery might work for this site with the idea that the crushed glass and the asphalt could be opened up and water could go down and could be kind of a small pilot project to, to start rethinking the surface of the city at a larger, more uh, engaged scale. So on the left, I love that one, the dead, the dead person, or the money, uh, stretch money guy that you would see at eye level. But what we really wanted to do is go for a, for a tattoo. So, and of course, uh, tattoos have, uh, if you think about the skin of a person <coughs> and the skin of a city, that would be a real direct correlation, I think. Uh, of course, the skin of the city, asphalt being painted, um, level of uh, communication in the surface. And of course, it has a long history of uh, body um, embellishing. Uh, but we thought the dragon would be cool. So this is the dragon collaged into Google Earth. 
And this is uh, how we thought it might work. There's a bicycle path next to it, as if this animal comes out of the forest under this bridge. And then, of course, uh, yeah, before you get that, you know, small project, not too difficult. Let's do a mock-up. <coughs> so uh, this is next to LaGuardia. And uh, the highway overpasses. Uh, and the New York DOT has an asphalt plant right here. But we can do a mock-up here. So. Um, the way how we felt we could do that within this budget is that we make a shape and that we pour, put, lay the asphalt around it, take the shape out. So plywood, uh, high density foam, and pink foam. But since the asphalt process uh, heats up to 400 degrees, we expected that both foams would melt. So we tried with aluminum foil at the edges and have a uh, release agents at the edges so we actually could get it out. But the high density foam, the yellow foam, the middle one, ended up really being the best. A totally unexpected result. Uh, and um, this project was really uh, important to realize the value of a mock-up that not only can you test uh, and evaluate ideas that you had, had already ha had, already have, that sentence doesn't quite right, uh, but also maybe come across things that you have not expected, which is really what we were doing. Um, uh, the Department of Sanitation, this is New York glass. This is the glass that's really used in the city. Comes at the, the Department of Sanitation, crushed. They don't know what to do with it. They cleaned it for us and they collected it for us, which is what we wanted to use. Uh, and then what we really liked is that the uh, asphalt had a relief, a uh, two-inch relief, that uh, I fought uh, hand and tooth to maintain uh, with a client uh, rather than uh, have it filled up to the edge of it. And then another reality of the site kicked in is that there are utilities there, there are uh, big trucks uh, passing by, a clear crossing that had to be maintained. So there were a lot of kind of site restrictions that meant that the dragon had to get tinier and tinier. Uh, please note the uh, jigsaw. Yeah, in the corner. Yeah. Um, I must say that uh, Ekip suggested the foam. So they were, as always, involved in the project. Um, so we cut the dragon like a jigsaw puzzle at their site. Okay, let's go back one second. And you see the yellow line around. We had to stay within that line. So the dragon had to cut amputated pieces. Um, of course, if you look on the internet for dragons, you can find many real tattoos. Um, but there's one, um, Ben Credible, this magic internet entity called Ben Credible. Uh, this dragon image comes from him or her. The client, Chris Lush, is in the middle. The left is an aluminum sign that had to be put up uh, for people not to trip. That's one team. And this is my son. <laughs> He's not too happy. Uh, and this is uh, putting it on site. Thank God for duct tape. Uh, washers and uh, Concrete screws. And um, the way uh, we speculate that this project cost at least 80 
close to $100,000 in man hours and days work of this incredible asphalt crew that then came to the site and it was incredible because the Galileo Orlando, the head honcho of the New York Department of Transportation, really saw that as a kind of um, inspiring moment for their workers to do something different and to do something else. So um, that's what's happening here. And the way how he puts it in the box is that it's a, a pothole fixing. Uh, for two reasons. One, because a pothole mixture does not have the two inch aggregate, but has everything less than three quarters inch, so we could have a finer job done. But also that just over there, within the road, there was a pothole that after they did this, they fixed that pothole. So that is how it went in the books. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the dragon uh, from the bridge with the Chrysler building you can see in the distance. Here too. And uh, this, I think, is quite fantastic, even maybe better than with a, with a glass. It would be good to do this at an enormous monster parking lot somewhere, I think, with the foam taken out. Uh, this is not a chemical. It's very wet cement that we poured in um, and s uh, loosely put the crushed glass in the wet cement uh, because I wanted to maintain the uh, two-inch reveal, but the client wanted to fill it up and have the crushed glass solid. So I think he caved, and I was bugging him maybe too much. He got, wanted to get rid of me perhaps, but um, this was the, our solution to... Um, <coughs> to have the crushed glass adhere to the surface because there was a fear that in New York everything that's loose will be taken away and that then this dragon would be empty. So this is how we solved it. And then this is the final project. This is elevated highway, elevated uh, Brooklyn Bridge. Manhattan is over there. And this is in real Google Earth. Huh? Huh? And that's my lecture. <laughs> is there anybody with a question? Comments? Uh, They don't know what to do with it. They have too much of it. What, what is it? It's beer bottles, wine bottles, clear glass. They don't so it. They do, but I think they only have a limited amount of uh, ways to use it. And it's not tumbled and it's sharp, so there was a request. Like, we could not use this glass because obviously the budget does not allow us to buy you know, pristine red or yellow glass from a supplier. So we had to find alternative sources. So, and it was great to really use local material. So they tumbled it in a cement mixer for us with old pieces of steel to make it nice and soft. And they washed it and so that's where the glass comes from. Did you think of, did you think of making the dragon in glass? Instead yeah, of we did actually. Glass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually considered grass, we considered pine needles, we considered... Um, uh, Antonio Pirazzi did this beautiful project in Metis with uh, cherry pits, really, really lovely. So, there was a lot. Because I think, you know, once you do a project, that project can go, can be like a tree, it can go in many different directions, but sometimes... And this project, I mean, what we're making was a giant pothole in the street and we filled it with glass. So, so, 
and we got that to happen. And it's, uh, people have been responding really well to it so far. Yeah. How long it's going to last, we don't know. According to uh, uh, the New York, they consider temporary art project has to be uh, 12 months or less. So, and whether it survives the winter, we, we, don't, we actually don't know right now. It's such a hard question. Well, for one thing, you would, you would maybe not have them in the first place and that people take public transportation. So it would really require that these big uh, endeavors would happen in a city somewhere. Right? I mean, the closer they are to an urban environment, the better it is. So I think that's the first one. And the second one, to not maximize parking spaces, to think about uh, permeable services to think about. Actually, there was this one great project that a student developed. He made it into a, a state forest campground, you know, kind of a dual purpose, uh, tailgate parties and camping. So, and real forested. So, you know, what I said earlier, many of these populist landscapes, landscapes of mass culture, they are dumb. They are dumbed down. They do not allow variety. They do not allow an intellectual pursuit. They do not allow creativity. And that is, I really believe, because they serve an enormous number of people. And there is a big problem in there, I think, something that needs to be addressed at many different uh, scales. And that idea you had about perforating the ash asphalt, is that, would that work long term? That seems brilliant. Because it's cheap. Yeah. Especially in the southern. Asphalt is soft. Yeah. Okay. So that doesn't work. Okay. Well, no. Even with your no, little, no. with your little color. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can do it with steel. You can do it with steel edging. Of course, it works. The other thing, if the holes will be a little bit bigger, they round it up because the asphalt is soft, and that might actually be even be more interesting. And the surface becomes also a speed bump. So, I think once you start investigating perforating as asphalt in holes, again, there's kind of a number of kind of ways where you can take it. You can fill them with gravel, but you can also plant them. Yeah. Huh? So and another idea that we had wanted to develop is to, to develop um, a porous asphalt, which really is an asphalt with a large aggregate. So there's a lot of uh, open pores. And then dust it with fine soil and seed it. So you would have actually a seeded asphalt. And then the more you drive in certain places, that's where the plants will not grow, but they would grow in other places, which would be fantastic, I think. So um, we have a real great fascination for asphalt. And actually, I didn't talk about that, because asphalt is a quite sustainable product, because it contains, it consists of 96% uh, local mined material. Asphalt can be recycled infinitely, and it uses a uh, leftover product of the oil industry as a binder. And that's what asphalt is. Compared to concrete, it's a much more sustainable product uh, than, uh, than concrete. So we love asphalt, but we also think there's way too much asphalt in the world, that the footprint, the asphalt footprint, or the hard surface footprint in the world needs to be substantially reduced, which really means that you know, this whole range between a solid seal surface and, uh, and soil, you know, there's gravel, pavers, gardens, trees, you know, there's a whole world in there between one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum. So. What, what thoughts do you have on um, snow removal? Because every project where I proposed something like a permeable paper <laughs> or asphalt that's broken yeah. up, the Denet, <coughs> Snow plows, you mentioned, yeah. etc. So, yeah. uh, the Har Harvard transportation. Th this topic comes up. Asphalt permeable asphalt comes up in relationship to winter regularly. As the Harvard Department of Transportation, for one thing, 
Chicago has a severe winter. They use permeable asphalt in their back alleys. This is about four years ago with great success. So that gives you an answer. Yeah. Thank you. Can I unhook myself?